Hey guys, it's Courtney, and I am here with my very first design team project for Honeybee Stamps. Today we're going to be creating a one-layer scene using the Treat Shop add-on stamp set, which actually goes with the House Builder die, but I'm going to use it for a one-layer scene. And we're going to be talking a little bit about perspective today. So my goal is to make this look like the inside of a bakery or a sweet shop. So I'm going to start by drawing in my back wall, which all I'm really doing is drawing in a rectangle. And you'll see that I am using my pencil first because you're probably going to end up with a whole lot of lines that you have to erase later. Next, I'm gonna find the center of this rectangle. And all I'm gonna do is meet the diagonal corners and draw a little X there so that at that middle of the X is my center. And that's going to be basically the point that I'm gonna use for every single object that I draw in. So I drew the wall where, where one wall meets the other as well as the floor. And then I'm going to go ahead and draw in my flooring. And I want this to be kind of like a tile floor. So I'm just going to evenly space out each one of the lines and I'm just using my ruler to do this. And then I'm going to start on those little dots and line up my ruler so that it goes right on that center portion of that rectangle all the way down. So these are gonna look a little wonky at first, but it's all perspective and once everything kind of comes together, it will make sense. The further out to the side that we get, the more angled those lines are gonna be. We just wanna to continue to use that point right there in the center of the rectangle. This is called the vanishing point, which if you guys remember in high school or maybe even middle school, we did this. We I loved this project where we had to do like a city street and we had to use the vanishing point and I still use it when I make my scene cards. So you can see that now I have my floor all drawn in and next I'm going to work on a door. Now my vertical lines are going to be exactly vertical, but the top portion of the door, I'm going to use that vanishing point again. I am also going to draw a a door frame because I want the main door to be glass. So again, I'm using that vanishing point just for the top portion of the door and the other two lines will be completely vertical. So I want to draw in a counter and this I don't have to worry about that vanishing point. I'm just pretty much straight lines, pretty much like the whole card. And I am going to draw a countertop and then the edge of the countertop as well as I guess it would be the other side of the cabinets. So you wouldn't actually see the cabinets from the end that we're looking at. But once everything is colored, you'll kind of get the idea of what it's supposed to be. Next, I now that I have everything drawn in, I can go ahead and start my stamping. I'm not gonna make any of these lines permanent until I'm happy with the placement of my images. So I want to start off with my table. Now the table, in this stamp set has an umbrella. Well, this is not an outdoor scene, so I'm going to mask off the umbrella, but I also want these two little Sundays to look like they're on the table. So I'm gonna need to stamp those first. So I line them up directly onto that stamp so I know my placement would be right. And then I can go ahead and stamp this out. I'm using blackout ink, it's a Copic Safe ink. And I'm also stamping this onto a scrap piece of post-it note tape. And I just cut out little masks for that. Next, I can go ahead and stamp out the table itself. Before I ink that up, I'm gonna take some more post-it note tape and mask off the umbrella as well as, I don't know, the thing that holds the umbrella, <laughs> the pole, I guess, that holds the umbrella. Ink up my stamp and then remove my post-it note tape, line that up directly over my little Sundays and stamp that down. You can see I have a little smudge there, so I'm just gonna use my sand eraser and lightly go over that several times. Whenever you're using a sand eraser, you wanna kind of gradually remove the color. It didn't completely remove it, but it lightened it up enough where once I do my coloring, you're never gonna know that it's there. So I'm going to stamp out both of these little chairs on either side of my table and then this little sign here that will have the today's specials on it. And then I'm just going to kind of fill in the counter. I also hung a little sign above the counter and this will be probably the name of the little sweet shop, I guess. <laughs> and I'm going to fill up the counter with a whole bunch of things. 
cakes and cupcakes and candy and everything else. Now, a lot of these stamps go together, so you can either use them by themselves or together, like this little jar off to the left-hand side. There's little pieces of candy that you can put inside the jar. You can put lollipops inside the jar, whatever you choose. So I'm just going to kind of fill in the entire counter with a whole bunch of these images. And then I'm also going to stamp out some of the words. So I'm going to use the sweet shop sentiment right there in the center of my sign. And again, I'm sticking with the Copic Safe ink because I'm going to color in this sign. And then I'm going to stamp the today's specials on that special sign. <laughs> Now that everything is stamped out, I am gonna go ahead and go over all of my lines with a Copic Safe Pen. Again, I'm gonna bring out my ruler because I can't trust myself to draw a straight line, and I'm just being careful to go around each one of my images. You can mask your images, but like, like you can see, I didn't really overlap too much except for those little Sundays on the table, but sometimes it helps if you have a mask in case you accidentally draw over them you can just remove the mask. But in this case, I didn't. So once everything was drawn in, I can finish up the floor. And how I'm going to do the floor is all I have to do is draw the horizontal lines at this point. And the further back the floor goes, the closer those horizontal lines are going to be to one another. So the further back a tile floor goes, the closer the tiles look together. They aren't really, but that's perspective. So I'm eyeballing it. You can certainly measure it if you feel more comfortable doing that, but I pretty much eyeball everything. <laughs> Last, I am going to take one more image from the stamp set, and this is kind of like the little banners, and I'm just going to stamp this three times along the edge of my counter. Next, I'm going to go through with my eraser and make sure none of my pencil lines are visible. Once you color over your pencil lines, you will not be able to remove them. So always make sure that you go over your entire panel with your eraser before you start your coloring. So I'm going to start off with the floor. And I'm not going to do a whole lot of shading to this, but I am going to bring in a W3 and a W1 just to add a little bit of the darkest areas to the floor, which is going to be the further back it goes. And I'm also going to create a shadow underneath this little sign as well as underneath the table leg as well as the little chairs. And then I'm going to bring in my W1 and I'm just going to blend that out a little bit. You can see that most of the floor is still left white at this point and I'm going to fill in every other tile with my R83 which is one of the pinks that I'll use several times in this card and I'm going to go directly over the areas that I've already shaded with those shading those shaded areas will still kind of show through that pink and I don't have to use multiple pinks so I went through the entire floor and colored in every other square I always prefer to color in my background before I actually color in my images, just in case I'm not happy with it. There's, I can always fix it easier before my images are actually colored. I risk any of my colors bleeding that way. So next I'm gonna move on to the walls. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to give these a lot of color, but I figured I'll just leave these white. So I am going to add shading. Anything that's white is still gonna have shadows on it. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of shading with my C5 from the bottom or the bottom portion of the wall. So basically where the wall meets the floor. And then I'm also going to add a little bit of a shadow on the corner of the wall with just the C5. Then I'm gonna move on to the C3 and I'm gonna blend these out a little bit further. And here's where I'm gonna add a little bit of shadow to the left-hand side of the door, as well as to the left-hand side and bottom of the sign that's hanging on the wall. Next, I'm gonna move on to the C1 and I'm just gonna flick this color out a little bit further. And you can see that I'm leaving a whole lot of white space here because I want these walls to still appear white. I'm gonna finish off with this C00 and this will just get rid of some of those flick lines. I ended up going over the entire thing, but it's such a light gray that it pretty much just looks white anyway. So once that's done, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the the, uh, the cabinets, I guess you could call them, and I'm gonna bring in some E30 markers. Now my shading for this is going to be underneath the edge of the countertop where it would kind of be hanging, where the counter would be hanging 
out off I guess or out a little bit that would cast a shadow and then also on the bottom portion of this area as well coming up from the floor I didn't put my darkest color there I'm saving that for my darkest mid-tone and I also created a shadow off to the left hand side of that little special sign now I am trying I'm trying <laughs> to go around my little banners that are hanging on my counter there but honestly, if you accidentally go over them, the colors that I'm using are light enough where I can go directly over them with a color and you're probably not gonna be able to tell the difference. I was a little careful, but I could have probably used a little bit more caution, but it all worked out in the end. So I blended that out with the E33 and then I'll move on to the E31 and you can see that I am going around each one of these banners quickly but I am going around them and then I will finish off with the E30 and this is pretty much just going to be right there in the center and these colors are a natural blending family so these colors blend really easily together I didn't even go in with my lightest color first I went right in with my darkest so next we're going to move on to the countertop itself and again I kind of played around in my mind what color I wanted this to be and ultimately I decided to go with the warm grays so the countertop is going to be darkest the further back it gets, just like the floor is. So the further back the counter is, so the closest to the wall behind it, behind it is going to be the darkest. And there's also going to be a shadow underneath each one of those objects that I stamped on top. So I, again, I'm gonna start right with my darkest color. The grays, whether it be cool grays or warm, warm grays, they typically blend really nicely together. So you don't necessarily need to get your paper super saturated in order to get these colors to blend. So I am going also with the edge of the counter that's kind of hanging off the side. I'm adding just a little bit of shading there too to differentiate this part with the main countertop. And you can see that I have my marker straight up and down when I'm working in this area to make sure that I'm barely touching the tip of the marker to it because obviously there's not a whole lot of space to work with. So I'm blending these areas out with the W5, including the little shadows underneath each one of those objects. And then I'll move on to the W3, and I'm gonna do the same exact thing, extending those shadows out and extending that shading out on the counter itself. And then I will finish off with the W1, and this will pretty much just be on the part of the counter that is closest to us. So next we are going to go ahead and pretty much color everything else. And I used a couple different color combinations for everything and I wanted everything to be really, really bright and pastel-like. So you'll see that I'll bring in the pinks a lot and here I'm gonna just add a little bit of color to the window. And I'm just going in solid with the BG11 and then I'm gonna take my colorless blender and I'm just gonna go over, make straight lines basically. And this will just be the reflection within the door and I'll deepen up the reflection a little bit once all the coloring is complete with a white gel pen. So next we're gonna go ahead and color in everything. <laughs> everything. So I'm going to start off with the sign here and I'm going to bring back out those R80 markers. And I am going to get this paper saturated a little bit first. So I'm going to color this in with my lightest color first. And then I'm going to go in with what I refer to as the scary dark color. So anytime you're looking for to get a lot of contrast within your coloring, bring in a scary dark. And the scary dark is significantly darker than what you want your image to be. But if you use it sparingly, I trust me, it will give you the results that you're looking for. It'll give you a whole lot of contrast. So I just added that shading off to the left-hand side and blended that out each time with the same ones, same markers as I used before. Now I'm gonna kind of skip around and I'm gonna bring out some more BG markers, this time more than just one, and I'm gonna color in the table as well as the chairs. And again, starting off with my darkest color because these are pretty tiny areas and I don't want to risk my color bleeding. So when you're working with smaller areas and you want to try to fit in as many colors as you want in order to get that contrast, I definitely recommend starting off with your darkest color. They may not blend as well as you'd like them to, but being at such a small area, nobody's ever going to know the difference. And being that you're not overly oversaturating the paper, your colors are less likely to bleed. In an area like this, if my colors bled, especially that darkest BG marker, probably would never be able to remove it. 
So you can see I also added a shadow underneath each one of my little sundaes that are sitting on the tables. And next I'm going to move on to some of the things that are on the counter. And you'll see that I skip around a lot because I really wasn't, I didn't have a plan in my head as far as the color combinations I wanted to use. So I kind of kept going back and forth. So for this cake stand, I wanted this to make it look as if it was metal. So I'm using those C markers again, but you'll see that I'm not leaving any white space this time. So I'm using pretty much the same color combination that I did for the walls, but I'm using more of my darkest colors and I'm not leaving any white space. So that's gonna differentiate between a gray or a silver object versus a white object. So I did the same thing for that little gumball machine and the base of that little cake plate there. And then I'm going to move on to the door frame. I told you I'm skipping around a lot. <laughs> so I'm just going to add a little bit of that shading towards the bottom where the door frame actually meets the floor. And then I'm going to blend that out with the two mid-tones and the lightest area is going to be on the very top. So I'm saving that for my V01. And after the door frame is all done, I'm going to go ahead and bring out a combination that I kind of wish I would have left out of the card, and it's more of a, a yellow-green combination. I should have gone for more of a mint green because this kind of stands out, but it is what it is. And I'm going to color the specials sign. And again, I'm going to add my shading off to the left-hand side. You can see that my darkest color is actually a G marker, and all the others will be Y G markers. So you can interchange color families, but also the G marker is what I refer to as the scary dark, and that's what's going to give that contrast. So blending that out with the YG07, then the YG03, and then I'll finish off with the YG21, which is super bright, very, very bright. <laughs> Next, I'm gonna move on to the cake and I'm gonna bring back out my BG markers. And now this is a round object. Each tier of this cake is a round object. Anytime you're coloring a round object, you wanna leave somewhat of a larger center highlight. And this is what's really gonna give you the shape. So I'm using flicking motions to add some shading on either side of each one of these tiers. And again, I'm only adding a little bit of these darker colors and leaving a pretty large area for that highlight color, much larger than I normally would. And this is what's gonna make these each one of these tiers appear to be round. So again, I'm gonna kind of skip back and forth coloring different objects, bringing out different color combinations, but pretty much going back to the ones that I've already used. So for this little cupcake, there's not a whole lot of room to work with. So whenever you're looking to get contrast in a teeny tiny area like that, you're better off just using two colors, but you don't want two colors that are similar to one another. So in this case, I used the same green combination that I used for the sign, but I used the darkest color as well as the lightest mid-tone. So I skipped the darkest mid-tone. That way the two colors are far enough apart from each other where I'm still going to get that contrast. Now I'm just going through and coloring in all of the other objects here, pretty much not bringing in any other color combination other than the ones I've already used before. I want these cupcake wrappers to appear white. So again, I left that white space and just added a little bit of shading on either side. I'm going to use those same E markers for the chocolate cupcakes as well as the chocolate ice cream that is sitting on the table. And in order for it to look chocolate, I just skipped the lightest color. I just used the darkest colors. And for the little hot fudge sundae that's on the counter. I just colored that in solid. So for these little candies that are in the gumball machine as well as this jar, I am just going to take some random colors and they're going to be the colors that I've used throughout the entire card and I'm not going to do any shading to any of them because they are so small but I am going to take one of the mid-tones from each color combination or each color family that I use throughout the card and fill these in pretty much randomly and for a small area like this and you have a whole bunch of them the shading is not necessary. You're going to have a whole lot of colors mixed in together and nobody's ever going to notice the difference whether or not you shaded them. So I also added a little bit of the warm gray one, which is significantly lighter than that portion of the 
countertop, but I wanted this to kind of show through some of the glass. You would see a little bit of that counter through the glass, so I didn't want this to be completely white. I also used the same color combination that I did for the candies for these little banners, and again, just kind of mixed them all up and used those mid-tone colors. Next, I'm going to bring back out that R80 combination that I've used several times throughout the card, and I'm going to go ahead and color the open sign that's hanging on the door. And again, just use, added my shading off to the left-hand side, leaving the right-hand side for my highlight. Also going to finish off the frame of my sign that's hanging on the wall. I'm going to bring back out those V markers and add my shading to the same area that I've added my shading with the R80 markers. So it kind of matches up. And as you can see, I added a few little squiggly lines to my special sign there just to make it look as if there was something there and there's actually some specials today. <laughs> Once all of my coloring was finally complete, I can go through and add some details with my white gel pen. And I'm going to add some reflections as well as some details to the cake. So I deepened up some of the reflections that are in the door and kind of just went over the same area that is that I used the colorless blender on. I added some highlights to the glass areas as well as some polka dots to the cake just to kind of give that some texture, I guess you could say. So once all of that was done, we are going to move on to the inside of the card and I'm using a sentiment from the Sweet Treats stamp set and I'm just using my grid mat here to line up the two sentiments, making sure that they are straight before popping them onto an acrylic block, stamping these out with VersaFine Onyx Black Ink right there in the center of the inside of my card and then I will take three of the little images from the treat shop add-on stamp set, the little popsicles and little ice cream cone. And I'm just going to stamp those right in the corner, in the bottom left-hand corner with that same VersaFine Onyx Black ink. And this will just add a little something to the inside. So I'm going to adhere my main panel to the my card base here. I prefer to use wet glue. That way I have a few seconds to move things around if I need to. I'm not great at lining things up the first time. And once that is dry, I'm going to add a little bit of glossy accents to just the areas that are glass with the exception of the door. So the bubblegum machine, the candy dish, as well as the cupcake stand or the cupcake holder, I guess. And then I'll finish off with some shimmer with a Nouveau Aqua Shimmer Pen to a whole bunch of different areas. And that is it. As always, I will leave all of the supplies that I used today in the description box below. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and have a great day. Bye.